Well, speaking of chickens, I feel like a big fat chicken right now, but the darkness is going to tremble because I will have no fear in Jesus. My name is Ashley Mosley. I am Brian's other half ministry partner doing life together. Thank you. I am the hurricane to Brian's calm, so you will see a strong difference this morning. I want to welcome everybody to the Springs today. If today is your first time, your first time in a long time, or you are a part of our family, thank you for spending the day with us today. And if you are watching on YouTube, I'm doing it. Welcome to our YouTube watchers. I didn't forget that part. Um, so... You've heard me, if you've been here for a while, you've heard me in the host moment talk about generosity and how I had things to share about that. And so this message was coming up, and it's been in the lineup for a while. And for a few weeks, Brian has asked me if I wanted to do the message. Deep down in my heart, I knew that I was supposed to, but my flesh was screaming no. Because I can talk to kids all day long. I love talking to kids. They can put up with my goofballness. I can mess up. It's totally fine. But to talk to adults makes me want to pass out just a little bit, being very honest with you. But I'm going to walk in obedience with the Lord. And then last Sunday, if you were here, Pastor Adam gave a word for me from the Lord. And it was last Sunday morning before Brian even left the house that he made me look him in the eye and tell him without a shadow of a doubt that I would be speaking this Sunday. So I reluctantly, although I knew I should, said, I will speak next Sunday. And when Adam shared that word with me, it confirmed that I was supposed to speak and step up in my role. So here I am. So you guys bear with me this morning. Thank you. I get a little nervous about my southern coming through, but that's okay, right, y'all? Okay, good. Okay, I need to confess a humongous problem that I have. It is, it's massive, it can be consuming, there might need to be an intervention. Brian would tell you there probably needs to be an intervention, but when I pull up to a particular store, And I tell myself, you go get the one or the two things that you need, and you set a time limit, and you get in, and you get out. That is your mission. You don't even grab a cart. By the way, in the South, we call them buggies. So if you hear anybody in a store saying, I've got a buggy, it's the cart. I learned the hard way here. We don't call them buggies. And so I get into this store, and I do not even make it past the dollar spot. (sighs) (sighs) The dollar spot, it's not even called that anymore at Target because now it's the $1 and the $3 and the $5 spot, but still, they're all such great values. And you look and you touch and they begin to speak to you and they're telling you to please take me home with you. This will look so good in your house. Your boys need this for learning. They will, it will be the teaching stuff. Oh, all the teaching stuff. Fall, oh my goodness, all the pumpkins and the leaves and just all the pretties. And then my hands are like this. And I'm like, it's okay. They were just a dollar. It's fine. And they're calling to me. And then one thing leads to another and I get a cart. I said I wouldn't get my buggy. And I get my cart and I put it in there. And then I totally lost my mind at this point and I go to all the clearance on the end caps all throughout the store because I'm justifying my purchases it's on clearance and Brian says Ashley you have to spend money to save money do not buy it so my time limit is shot I likely don't leave with the one or two things I even went in there for. There was honestly one time that Brian called me. I was supposed to be at the grocery store, and I made a quick trip to Target beforehand. And he said, what are we doing for dinner tonight? And I looked at my watch, and I had been in Target for an hour. I had still not been to the grocery store, and I had nothing for dinner. And I quickly scrambled to tell him something easy to fix, probably cereal, because (laughs) that's how it goes in my home. 
and I got myself out of Target. So my solution, friends, is I either have to take practical Brian with me because we are not going to be looking at the clearance end caps in Target if he's with me. I need to have a cash budget in hand or I just don't need to go. And that's mostly what I do. I just do not go to Target. Can anybody else relate with me? I see, ah, uh, mostly women. I got you. I got you. Oh, gosh. See, Kevin has to help me. I thought I did it right. Just a hair like that. Am I too loud? It's better. Down more. Is that better? That's better. Okay. You guys just tell me if it's too loud, and I'll tone it down. Okay, so you, got, you ladies are with me. Some of you men are with me. Who are the shopping men in the room? Very, okay, very few. Brian would rather be shot in the foot than to go <laughs> shopping. And I have three of those, three more of those men at home. So, girls, I need some people to go shopping with, with a cash budget, of course. Okay, so here's what I want to say. There's nothing wrong with shopping and buying treasures and buying things as long as you know that those treasures that you buy are not going to leave this earth with you. You can have the pretties in your home, and you can have the new clothes, and you can have the things. It's fine, as long as it's within your budget, and as long as you know within your heart, Matthew 6, 19 through 20, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Investing in the kingdom of God is the very best place for your investments. You can have the pretties as long as they're within your budget. But when you are investing into God's work, you are investing in life change and you are investing in someone's eternity. So I once really did struggle with wanting all the things. I wanted the American dream. I wanted the big, beautiful house. I wanted the nicest cars. I wanted the best clothes. I wanted, wanted, wanted. I was in college working a job. I had to pay for part of my tuition. I was working to maintain a high grade point average so that I could get a scholarship. And I had all the heart eyes for Brian Mosley when I was introduced to the concept of giving to the Lord. And I thought it was the most absolute absurd thing that I'd ever heard in my life. I'm working hard for this money. I'm going from class to my job, back to class, staying up late studying, going back to my job. I'm working for this money. And you want me to give some of it to the Lord? And then I, and, and I started hearing messages at church and reading scriptures in the Bible. And it, things like messages like this that made me squirm in my seat. So if you're squirming right now, I totally get it. I was once there. It made me nervous when the church talked about money. But what I learned over time is that money is one of our greatest possessions. We hold it very dear. And when we can hold our money with open hands to the Lord, he's going to bless us far more than if we hold it with closed hands to ourselves. So I justified and I calculated. And guys, I would go to the mall while in college and buy Brian a, like a Ralph Lauren polo shirt for like, you know, a lot of money when I need to be paying for tuition. But I couldn't give money to God because I had heart eyes for Brian. And I'm trying to woo him by buying him this fancy shirt that he probably didn't even care about. <sighs> My priorities were totally out of balance. But as I studied those scriptures and as I listened to messages and I began to pray, I decided I was going to stick my toe into the water and just give it a try. And over time, I realized I can't outgive God. I had more by giving money away. It didn't make sense at first. It didn't make sense how giving it away would free me to have more. But I did. And then I saw what was happening with my investment into the church. I got to see lives changed. I got to see friends' lives changed. I witnessed my own life changing. In, I was in a, like a student ministry at the time and being a student leader. It was incredible. So I want you to be thinking, can you relate with what in the world I'm talking about? 
Have you ever thought that the mere sound of giving away your money was absolutely appalling and absurd? It didn't make sense in your budget. You kind of get sweaty and, and nervous and squirming while this lady's up there talking about money. Giving your money is going to cost you something, and you don't like that. I have totally lived there. I believe there are some common barriers that we might share that hinder us from giving. Number one is bad experiences. Maybe you've given before. You've given to someone. You've given to something, an organization, and then you heard that organization mishandled the funds. So now you're incredibly cautious, and I'm not going to do that anymore. Maybe you've heard of television evangelists living the high life, and you start calculating, and you're like, I can't do that. Why am I going to invest in that ministry? They're getting to go on elaborate vacations and drive fancy cars. I can't. I don't want to give money. Um, you've, you've, you've been burned in some kind of way. Here's what I want you to know. Am I still doing it? to go to this. I was excited about this head thing. Okay, here we go, head thing. Okay, fancy words. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I want, what I want you to know about the Springs Church is that we have a team of trustees that meet together quarterly, and they review the budget every quarter. They know exactly where the money is going. They have eyes on it, and we as a couple and as a team, as a staff, we prayerfully ask the Lord how to wisely use the money that you invest in his kingdom here at this local church. You can also look on the website. Our budget is on there, free for everyone to see. So we want to be very clear with how we are using the investment into God's kingdom here at the Springs. So it's good to show wisdom when you are investing. You want to invest your money. You want to give your money to good soil, good ground. So always prayerfully consider before you're giving any kind of any kind of monetary offering, pray and ask the Lord for peace as to where you're giving that. Barrier number two, this one may sting a little bit, and I really had to check my heart on this as I was thinking, but sometimes we're just greedy and we're just selfish. It's my money. I work 40 plus hours a week. I pay taxes. I'm doing this, this, and this, and it is my money, and I am going to enjoy it. We need to check our attitudes on that. Sometimes we want the American dream more than we want to fulfill the Great Commission. And the American dream is all about us. And the American dream is all about keeping up with the Joneses. But sometimes if we can let go of a little of what we're bringing in, guess what? The Joneses might meet you in heaven one day. Instead of you trying to keep up with them and have bigger and better than them, if you are investing into kingdom work, you're going to be neighbors in mansions in heaven. And I can't think of a better investment. I wanted the American dream so bad. I wanted the pool. I wanted the super nice cars. I wanted the houses. I wanted the vacations. I wanted it all. And then God said, <laughs> Are you going to live in obedience to me and trust me? Or are you going to strive and are you going to toil to try to get that American dream? Guys, those of you that know, Brian and I and our boys moved here, I think, oh, almost five, six years ago from Tennessee and laid it all down and came out here with our possessions. And Brian worked a part-time job at U-Haul in, I think it was the hottest summer ever, um, but we were walking in obedience, and we were walking in, the fa in faith with God, and we have never, ever done without. We made it through some incredibly tough times where I'm like, hello, God. Uh, you said you were going to provide. I just couldn't see it, but he was. We've never gone without because he is faithful. Barrier number three might be one of the biggest barriers is the fear of not having enough. When I give my money anywhere other than my bank account, I'm not going to have enough. And I'm thinking about everything that's already going out, and I don't have enough. 
it's already tight at the end of the week. I get to that two-week mark, and man, I am scraping. We are opening the cabinets and eating crackers. We're trying to make it. I don't understand how you're telling me that you're asking me to give more. I understand that fear. I've been there. So when I think about the three barriers, and like those are pretty scary, what can I do to calm my fear, to calm the greed within me, to calm the bad experience? And the answer is simple, turning to God and turning to his word. The Bible eases my fears. I believe with every fiber in my being that the Bible is 100% truth. It's our instruction manual on life. When I don't know an answer, I can go there and I can find it. And I'm going to share with you several things from the word of God today. Let's walk through 2 Corinthians verse, or chapter 9, verse 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Basically, guys, to put it to you short, you get what you give. If you sow, it's all mine, guess what? You're going to get it's all mine and nothing more. It's a, simple, it's a simple process. If you sow generosity, you're going to get you're going to get generosity. You guys are going to have to be like the kids over there because, like, like, you're going to have to be. When you sow generosity, you get generosity. generosity. Ray, you're a good child. Good job, Ray. So I have this story. I talk a lot in stories in my hands. If you cut my hands off, I can't talk. Um, there, and when we lived in Chattanooga, when Brian and I, before we served at City Church of Chattanooga, we were going through a discipleship. Um, class there with our pastor, and there was another man in this class, and the man was incredibly just humble, and I came to find out that this man was a CEO of a huge trucking company in Chattanooga, and that he had a lot of money. He was doing very well in life. You didn't know it looking at him. He loved the Lord, and guess what? That man used his money freely for God. He never boasted about it, but you knew that, that David Parker was pouring in to the kingdom of God. One Sunday, Brian and I were sitting on the very back pew. I know, sitting in the back. We were sitting in the back. Sitting in the very back pew. And David Parker was on the other side of the pew, and there was no one in between us. And they were receiving offering. So the offering bucket went to David first. And then he stood up and walked it over to me. And I threw in my singles. And when I threw in my singles, I saw in the bucket, I wasn't trying to look. I really wasn't. Just like putting it in there. Uh, you know, like people get nervous. Put it in there. And there was a neatly folded stack of $100 bills. And my singles seemed very insignificant at that moment. And I whispered a, whispered a prayer to God in my heart. And I said, God, if you would make me wealthy like David, I will give freely like he gives. Guys, I still remember it like it was yesterday. God spoke right back to my heart, and he said, what are you doing with what I've given you? Mm, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Point is, God didn't see hundreds and singles. He didn't see and go, oh, David Parker, I just love you so much. You just gave a wad of hundreds in there. And then said, oh, Ashley, that's pathetic. You only gave singles. In God's eyes, it's what's in the heart behind your giving. It's not the amount that you're giving. My singles cost me just as much as David Parker's hundreds cost him in the grand scheme of things. And I've always taken that, and I've I decided then and there, it doesn't matter how little I have or how much I have. It's the heart that I have that is attached to my giving. And I will faithfully give to him. So I want you to give with an open in a generous heart. So this eases my fear of not having enough. If I give, then God's going to give to me. Okay. It's as simple as that. It doesn't even take rocket science. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 
9, verses 7 through 8. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Here's the point. Generosity is a matter of the heart. Verse 7 says that we should give as we have decided in our heart to give. Not because Ashley's standing on the stage telling you to give or asking you to give. We don't give out of guilt. We don't give out of compulsion. But we give out of what we've decided in our heart to give. Well, Ashley, how do we do that? I'm so glad you asked because here's what Brian and I do. Brian and I, we have decided in our hearts that we are going to bring the tithe. We believe in bringing the tithe, which is a tenth of our income, back to the Lord. Ashley, that is nonsense. Where do you get that from? I'm glad you asked about that too. In the book of Malachi, let's look at chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 6 through 12. I, the Lord, do not change. So you... The descendants of Jacob are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you in tithes and offerings? You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Oh, that seems awfully harsh, God. But watch this. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will, be not, there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Here's the deal, guys. I know Malachi is in the Old Testament, and some of you are already thinking, well, that's under the law. We are not under the law anymore. We understand that fully. We have complete freedom in Christ. However, we believe, Brian and I believe, that the principle of bringing the first 10% back to God is a starting point for our giving. He mentions that in the Old Testament, in Malachi. And the thing is, it's all his money anyway. He gave you that job. He's going to provide you with that tax return. He's helped you get the house that you were in. He provided that car for you. It's incredible what God has done for you. It's all his, and all he's basically asking is, can you give me a small little fraction back so I can use it in my house in the church to further my kingdom purposes sounds like a pretty good investment to me for new testament christians tithing should be the floor of our giving not the ceiling so that's kind of where we start with tithe is with tithing and then anything beyond a tithe is called an offering we'll talk more about that in a second um if he asks us to bring the first tenth, our tithe, that is our tithe. Anything above that is our offering. The storehouse is the local church. It's kind of like the catapult to ministry. There are amazing ministries around this city. And I encourage you to look into those, to be a part of those. But today we're talking about the Springs Church and what God is doing here. This is the storehouse. 
This is where ministry begins, and it should go out of here. It's where we come together on Sundays to meet and learn and grow and fellowship together. And then we go out of here. We launch out of here during the week, and we spread the word of the Lord at our jobs, at our schools, with our families. We do different things around here. We have children's ministry, and if you've been here for a while, you know that that is a passion of my heart. Those kids are back there right now with curriculum that has been bought, resources that have been bought to pour in and invest in their kingdom purposes. They are learning and they are growing. We want to use what comes in faithfully for the Lord to further what he is doing. For us, for for us, giving is not something that we have to do, meaning we're not under the law. But giving is something that we get to do because we are under grace. And we can give it out because he's given so freely to us. And he's never going to let us fail. All of this tames my selfish and greedy heart. Let's finish reading 2 Corinthians 9, 10 through 11. It promises us that he will provide and that he will increase. Can I get an amen? Yes. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Praise God for increase. He's telling us if we'll be faithful and we'll give to him, he will increase what we have. I don't know how it works, but I'm not God. Thank God that he is and he does it. I have some stories to share with you guys about this. Number three, you cannot outgive God. We're going to bounce back to Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Basically, he gives you a triple dog dare. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, he says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. Hallelujah, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Let me show you what that looks like. Brian's going to make me clean that up today. Okay. It doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to be pouring out money on you, but he says that he's going to pour out blessing on you. And if you've ever been a recipient of some kind of blessing from the Lord, whether it was cash that you didn't expect or whether it was tires on your car, Guys, that's a story I have for you. I stood in this very sanctuary, and somebody told us, your tire is going bad, and it looks like the other ones might need to be replaced too. And I knew that Brian was in a little bit of a panic, and so was I, because we did not have the money to replace four tires. And somebody stood in here and overheard that and said, go get your van. We'll replace your tire. And when they... Let us know later, they replaced all four tires for us. That is God. That is not us. That is him being faithful. No, he didn't give us money, but in essence, he did because those people blessed us. And I guarantee you that the Lord opened the floodgates of heaven back and blessed those people back for their blessing on us. In 2016, not that long ago, some of you have heard this story, so pardon me, but it bears repeating. We were going through probably the hardest time financially that we had ever gone through. We were getting rent notices on our door. That was fun. It was also November, which meant December was coming. And I was getting in a little bit of a panic. Brian wasn't taking a paycheck. I homeschool our boys. That is walking in obedience. Scares the mess out of me and often frustrates me. If you're a homeschool parent, you understand. And I started thinking, I've got to go get a job. Brian was thinking, I've got to go get another job. And we could not imagine how he could put another job on his plate when he was involved in full-time ministry. So 
the notices would come on the door, and then there would be just enough to pay the rent. Our boys grow like warp speed, and they needed new shoes. Their toes were at the end of their shoes. And as a little girl, I never did without shoes that fit me. But my boys were having to just kind of bear through it because we didn't have the money. And sometimes it was honestly at that point where we would scrape by with peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And I said, God, I don't understand because we give you the first and you said. And so then I just remembered something I had been taught. Pray to God his word. (laughs) Remind him. It's not that he needs reminding. It's that I need a reminding. I wrote Jehovah Jireh on my bathroom mirror. You can write on your bathroom mirrors with um, expo markers and it comes off. It's great. I wrote Jehovah Jireh on there and I circled it. And I did little lines off. And I started telling Jehovah Jireh, God, my provider, what we needed. Rent. Groceries. Shoes for the boys. And then I started telling him what I wanted. It was Christmas time. And I had three little boys that were asking for Christmas presents. And they had no idea. We think they had no idea. They probably do because kids know what kind of pressure and stress we were under. So I wrote Christmas for the boys. And one day, I was sitting in the living room, and there was a knock on my door. And I opened the door, and it was a friend. And she said, I need you to get dressed. I'm taking you to the grocery store. Well, I immediately got mad at Brian because I thought, Brian told somebody. And he doesn't tell. He's very private. He does not tell people. And he's told them, and this is humbling, and this is embarrassing. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, I need you to get dressed. God told me, he's been telling me for weeks that I'm supposed to take you to the grocery store, and I need to walk in obedience and take you to the grocery store. So I ran upstairs, and I called Brian. I'm like, what did you do? He's like, I didn't say a word, Ashley. I didn't say a word. And if you've ever been in that place, it's very humbling to watch, walk through the grocery store with somebody that's going to buy you food, and they tell you, put whatever you want in the grocery cart. And I believe God needed to take me to that level of humility to let me know, I got you. <laughs> I've got you, girl. This is, not you. this is not on you. You're walking in obedience, and you came out here to fulfill a call, and I have you. No, you don't have you, but I do. So I filled up that grocery cart, and we had food. I had a friend call me from Tennessee, and she's like, we feel like we need to get the boys something for Christmas. And what do they need? Or what do they want? And I'm like, they need shoes. They need shoes. Well, not, I don't know, a week or so later, there was another knock at my door. And I'm laying on the couch with a horrific migraine, likely from the stress of everything. And there at my door stands my friend from Tennessee. And I'm like, what in the world are you doing here? And she said, God wanted me to give you a hug. And she wrapped her arms around me and she hugged me. And she took my family out that night where we had not been able to do anything enjoyable. And she took us to Joe's Crab Shack, Warner Jude's favorite place, and he was so sad that it's gone until Chick-fil-A was there, and then he's fine. (laughs) (laughs) And she treated us to dinner. And while she was here, she took the boys, and she got them shoes. And she took me to the grocery store, and she bought us groceries. And she had no idea what we had been going through. And one by one, on my mirror, Jehovah Jireh, I got to mark them off. And I got to give him praise. So although it may look grim, and it may look like God is not doing what he said he would do, I assure you that he is. I have a friend in this room that walked through job loss after job loss and had been giving 
and had dipped their toe in the water and like, I'm going to give to the Lord. And then I lose a job. I can only imagine. And then God gave him a job. And then he lost that job. And then God gave him an even better job that he could not have even imagined. And he's so happy. I don't know. I'd like to think that God knew that this new job was coming open. So he gave him this one that he lost in the middle just as kind of a holding place until he got this job that came open at just the right time. The same family, their car messed up and quit working. Well, God didn't give them just tons and tons and tons of money, but he gave them a new car. I, I think that that is a blessing. You cannot outgive God. You can't do it. I dare you to try. You can't do it. But if you're standing there with your hand like this, he's never going to have the opportunity to show you what he can do. Because he wants you to let go and he wants you to walk in obedience with him. Let's look at point number four. Giving allows God to free you from being possessed by your possessions. You've heard that before because that came from Pastor Brian. And as I was studying this, I had written that in my Bible, and it was so good that it bears repeating. Giving frees you from being possessed by your possessions. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 11, it says, I will prevent pests from devouring your crops. And the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. What that means is he's going to take care of you. And he's going to take care of your provisions. And he is going to provide for you. He's not going to let it rot. He will come through. Generosity involves a whole lot more than just our finances. It also involves our time and our talent. That's another thing that just is near and dear to my heart. God has given every single one of you in this room some kind of talent, some kind of gift. He's also given us time. Psalm 90, 12 says, Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. I ask you, what are you doing with your days? What are you doing with your time? Ephesians 5, verses 15 and 16 say, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. Because the days are evil. And you guys know that. We are living in evil days. What are we doing with our time? What are we doing with our opportunities? Where is your investment? Is it toiling your land and having enough for you? Or is it in making the name of Jesus famous? In Romans 12, 5 through 10, it talks about our talents. So in Christ, we, though many, we form one body. And each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, well, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Time and talent go together. I believe your talents lead you to what you should do with your time. Can you sing? Dave can sing. I didn't know that Dave could sing. Crystal, wherever my girl Crystal is, she can sing. Today, both of those stepped here up here for the first time to sing. Use their talent for the Lord. Y'all know that you don't want me up here singing. You know you don't. You know you don't. You know that you don't want me up here playing because I haven't been given that gift. And I'm okay with that because when I get to heaven, I'm going to tell Jesus I want to sing now. And um, he's going to let me. It's going to be awesome. So you great. Are you good with kids? Silence. See, but there's somebody in here that is awesome with kids. Just like Dave. Dave. 
I mean, seriously, man, that blew me away today, you using your gift for the Lord. They, we didn't know. And then when God released him and he was ready, he stepped up. There's somebody sitting in here that's amazing with kids. We need you. I'm just going to tell you straight up. We need you and they need you. They need people to teach them and to lead them and love on them. You have no idea what some of those kids go through before they walk through these doors. You have no idea the pressure they're going through at school, maybe the peer pressure they're going through, maybe things are going on at home that no one knows about, maybe mom and dad are having a hard time. These kids need a safe place, and they need somebody to love on them, and for an hour and a half on Sunday to just turn their world upside down for Jesus. Maybe you're really good like me, talking people's ears off. If so, Heather, wherever she went, needs you on the hospitality team because we need you to love on people when they walk through these doors. It is terrifying to go to a church for the first time. It is scary pulling in the parking lot. It is just heart-wrenching walking through the door. And one thing that we want this place to be is a place of family where you're going to likely get a hug uh, from somebody, probably me, before you leave this building. Because maybe you're not getting any of that with what the evil world is providing outside of these four walls. Maybe you're really good at organization. I am not. Nobody wants me to organize anything. It's horrible. <laughs> but we need you. Believe me, the kids spring cabinets need you. Can I get an amen, Holly? <laughs> yes. Maybe you really enjoy cleaning. I don't know. Maybe you do. And that's relaxing to you. You can come to my house first, and then we need you here. <sighs> okay. But we have facilities around here that need to be cleaned. And that's one of my very favorite ministries is the ministry that is never seen. But you reap the benefits of it. It's the people that show up to clean the toilets and vacuum the floors and make this place presentable for our family and our guests. You never see them. If you are on our cleaning, housekeeping crew, can you just raise your hand, please? Thank you, Sal. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for all that you do. You are not overlooked, and you are loved and very much needed, and I need help cleaning up all this play money in a little bit. Okay. Nice save. Somebody has my back over there. So here's some practical steps, and I'm going to wrap this up. Worship team, I did it. Worship team, you can come on up here while I wrap up, while I wrap up and bring this thing in for a landing. I'm getting to use all that pastoral talk. I'm going to bring it in for a landing. I'm just kidding. Okay, practical step number one. Decide in your heart that you are going to be a giver with your time, your talent, and your treasure. It's a very practical step. Just decide. Be stubborn about it. We get stubborn a lot, a lot of things, and then when it comes to things that might cost us something, we're not stubborn about it anymore. Decide that you're going to be stubborn. You are not doing this for man. You are serving like Jesus. Let your yes be yes. Make a commitment. I'm going to be like God and just triple dog dare you and just test God in it. And see if he will not bless you with more time. You may find that you really enjoy it. I have some of the greatest friends on the Kids Spring team. We had a meeting the other day and half of it was spent laughing. That is a great, great day. You're going to find family when you serve. Practical step two is create a budget. Hello. Create a budget. And make generosity your first line item. Before the rent, before the house payment, before the car payment, generosity is first. Because if you leave it to last, I guarantee you it's not going to be there to give. And then you're hindering yourself and you're missing out for your own blessing. 
make it first. And if you have to quit going to Starbucks or eating out a couple of times during the week, try it. And I promise you, you're going to end up having more. I, I promise you. Three, take inventory of the gifts and talents God has given you. This year, my word has been identity. Guys, I know who I am in Christ. But I've been asking him, what do you want me to do in you? The personality that you've given me where I wear my heart on the sleeve and I get my feelings hurt super easily. God, what do you want me to do with that? And what, how do you want me to use me in the talents you've given me for your glory? If you're like, I have no idea what talents I have, Pastor Rory said it. Come join us in Growth Track. We will help you. We have some really cool resources to help you start to pinpoint the talents that God has given you. Mine is not singing. Maddie, it's coming. Okay. You'll see what I mean in a minute. Oh, we're going to actually do it right now. We're just going to go ahead and do it right now. I love children. Maddie's not really a child anymore. She's a teenager, and today's her birthday. And I aim to make people super-duper happy, and I want to sing, so here's my chance. So I need you to join in with me as we serenade this beautiful girl for her birthday. Come here, Maddie. I'm going to make it even worse for you. Maddie is one of my super-dear sweet friends, and she also serves with us and kids. So I need you to sing with, her, with me. Here we go. <clears throat> La, 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 la. Don't let me sing by myself. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Maddie. Happy birthday to I know, happy birthday, yes, yes, I know Amanda is ready to put me on the worship team. You said, oh, she said yes. She'll lead me down here, she'll lead me down here to be a worshiper. Step four, join a ministry team. They need you up here. If you can sing, if you can play an instrument, if you can play the keys, yes, they need you up here. If you are good with techie stuff and you can pay attention, they need you in the production booth. You don't want me back there in the production booth. Everything would go wrong and lyrics for the songs would never be changed because I'd be too busy praising the Lord. So if you're good with that, they need you back there. I want you to pray about what ministry team you can join. We have the dream team around here, and we have our cool new shirts, and they're soft. They're super soft. You can sleep in them. I know. It happens often. And the, our dream team is never full. There's always space for you. We don't want you just to be a seat warmer in here. It's good to be in here, and it's good to connect, but it's better to serve. And we want you to join a life group. We have a need. Yes, life groups. We have a need for life group leaders. God is telling some of you, I want you to lead. I want you to step up. And I want you to teach. I want you to teach adults. I want you to open up your home. If that is you today, I need you to talk to Pastor Adam. Wave to them, Pastor Adam. Because we need you. We have people that are waiting to get in a life group because we need you. So I'm going to triple dog dare you in the name of the Lord to step out of your comfort zone and let God shine through you. It's not about you. It's about you walking in obedience with him. And number five is trust God with your 2019. Make 2019 different than 2018. Decide that you're going to be a giver, that it's going to come out first, and just test him in it. Do an experiment. Is this really going to pay off, Lord? But don't do it with a reluctant heart. 
do it with a heart of, God, this is yours. You gave it to me, and I'm giving it back to you, and I am trusting you every step of the way. In 2019, start serving somewhere. Don't just sit and listen, but serve. Step up. If you're good with kids, if you're good up here and you're scared to death, guys, I was scared to death, and this has not been perfect today, but I am walking in obedience to him. If you're good at, you've got muscles and you can drag signs to the road, people need to know where to turn in here. It's super important. Test God in it. Dip your toe in and see if you don't just fall in love with serving and that you have a purpose and a plan and you're not just on this earth just to exist. You're on this earth to thrive. I want you to imagine what God is going to do with your year, with your time and your talent and your treasure. Let's stand, please.